Yes. Can you really hear me okay? Can you say this again? Thank you again. It's very, very, always grateful to be here at ESOG each year, and especially this year. Uh, this is the Syncom Small Talk Roadmap for 2016. Uh, if you're not familiar with Syncom, we're the leading provider of Small Talk. Uh, we have a, a, a fairly sizable number of uh, people passionate about Small Talk that we, that we employ at Syncom. So this is what we'll be talking about today. First, I'm going to mention some of the other talks we have by uh, uh, Syncom personnel here, tell you a little bit about what I do as a product manager, talk about some legacy frameworks in our product. Uh, we'll spend the most time talking about product changes, and we'll talk about some big changes, some big recent changes, things in our current products, and then a little bit of an eye for the future. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about small talk advocacy. If you have questions, if, if they can wait to the end, great. If they can't, that's okay too. So first I want to bring your attention to other, other Syncom Small Talk talks. Uh, this is the, the, the first one, the roadmap of where the product has been, and where it is now, and where it's going. Uh, later today I'll give a talk called Hidden Gems in Syncom Small Talk. It's, it's things in the product that if you don't know about them, you, you should. Useful things that may not be obvious. Andreas is going to to give a couple of presentations. First on the, uh, the next generation user interface uh, in our products and all the, all the great things that it lets you do from a Windows perspective. Later he'll also be talking about the Object Studio Launcher which uses that and it, it's a nice, a lot of convenient and productivity things all on this new launcher. So I think any small talker will appreciate what what that has in, in its new design. Uh, Jerry, who's also here, will be giving a couple presentations. One on the latest, greatest things in Syncom Small Talk protocols. Uh, later, we'll also talk about using AppX, another web framework, and using that with Chrome and using Chrome in a much more Small Talk like manner, rapid application development. And finally, Neil will be talking about extreme programming and his experience with that over, over 10 or 15 years. And if you've ever done any XP, uh, I think you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate the insights and, and things that he points out in the presentation. Okay, so product management, what are, what are some of our goals? Well, we want to keep small talk relevant, vibrant, so we have to keep improving it, keep changing it. If you don't stop changing, your, you start dying. So some of the reasons we need to change it are, 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 are outside exogenous events, like new operating systems come out, or new versions of operating systems, new standards that come out. Um, but primarily, customer needs. So just like in real estate, location, location, location is important. We make sure that we we listen to customers. What we really need to know what they need in the future, what they're doing, where they're going, because really the, the, our success is, is for them to be successful. Uh, we get customer involvement in, in a number of ways. Uh, one of those ways that we have fairly regular mini surveys or product management mini surveys. If you're a customer, you may uh, get some of these emails. So we reach out to our customer base saying, is this important to you? We're thinking about this. Tell us about, about your usage. So these things are really, really important in driving the direction of the product. Uh, another thing that we do in some of those new things that we develop, we often get direct customer involvement. Uh, some specifications for things are, are written so loosely that you could develop something exactly to those specifications and it could be useless to the customer. So we like to get customer involvement so that we know when we deliver something, it's, it's usable and the customer can give us feedback and make sure that it's, it's what they need. And then 
with their familiarity with it, as soon as it is delivered in the product, they, they can hit the ground running because they're already familiar with that. In our, our new release and on our website, we have a list of things that we consider legacy. Legacy are things that are either obsolete, they're antiquated, they've been replaced by newer technology, and th those items will basically have minimal support and they will not be enhanced. So why don't we just remove them from the product like, like probably most software vendors do in general? Well, over, over time a lot of them will be removed from the product, but we know that some customers are continuing to use them and want to use them longer, or they want extra time in order to move to the newer technology, or they may decide that, you know, this is my lowest cost option. I'm going to maintain it myself and keep on using it and, and we recognize all those as being valid. What we do want to do though, and it's, it's really important, is that we, we communicate that to our customers to improve their planning and also from our perspective, we want to make sure that we're, we're spending our resources on things that customers need the most. So let's talk some about the products. Our Object Studio and VisualWorks product are two small talk products. How do we think about those products? Well, Object Studio we think of as the, the business analyst thinking tool. So you can take a developer, an architect, a domain expert, sit them down and they can use the tools in Object Studio to, to be very productive. So, so it's a different set of tools and and, and means of development. Object Studio is also Windows, Windows centric. VisualWorks is cross-platform, it's the do anything cross-platform, scientific or business purposes development tool. Another thing to note with the two products is that both share a foundation. So most of the things that I talk about today are changes to the, the foundation. So they're, they're things that are shared by both products. <coughs> Let's talk about the past. Most of these things are either major things or, or things in the recent past. With our foundation 8.0 forward, we started introducing some fairly significant changes in the products, some big improvements. Uh, I, I called it some of these Millennium changes, meaning they were first developed before the year 2000, and now they're, they're due for, for being revamped and improved. So we're also calling a lot of these two, version 2.0 because they're significant. So one of the things that we introduced in the recent past since 8.0 is text 2. We realized that text needed a lot of improvements to support a lot of the changes that we wanted to make in the future. So we basically clean sheet developed text too. This is a list of, of a lot of the things it does and, and a lot of these things text simply cannot do. Uh, even some interesting ones like spark lines and other things that, 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 may, be, that may be new. So text too is a foundation for a lot of the improvements that we've, been, that we've been working on. One of those improvements is the new source code editor. And another piece of feedback I was getting from customers and community members is, hey, hey it's great you've got goodies that you can load in to do autocomplete, but that should be built into the product. Most products today have that, you should too. So our new source code editor first version came with a, with a basic autocomplete. Basically the, our first step in there. Uh, the new source code editor also came out with editor themes and that allows you to, to colorize. You can basically color and have in context your, your whole method. So your instance variables, uh, different messages, uh, different nesting things can all be in different colors different fonts and sizes if you, ch if you chose, 
And so there's a whole, whole suite of built-in themes that you can choose from. But you can also look through there. It's easy to, to build your own. You can customize and make it exactly how you think it should work, relatively easily. Another thing in the new source code editor, when you compile a method, all the errors and warnings are annotations. And I like to say this is, this is nothing or this is everything. So it's a small change, but it also has big implications. Because since the beginning of small talk, when you compile a method and you get your errors and warnings, and you, you hit typically escape to, to make them go away, if you slip and hit the wrong key, now you have all that embedded in your code. So you have to go through and manually remove it. A, a minor annoyance, but with the annotations, that's, that's no longer an issue. So a, a decades old problem in Smalltalk is now gone with this change. And, and the developers using the product day to day really appreciate that. Another thing, APIs. One of the big advantages of using small talk in general and talking to our customers is small, our small talk environments are all written in small talk and all of our big customers leverage that. You can, you can customize all the tools and development process to better suit your exact needs. Something fairly unique to small talk. So like with this new source code editor, there's an API, it's pluggable. If you have a domain-specific language you want to support, you can easily support that with this new source code editor. Some other changes on the VM side. Our Windows VMs uh, are all Unicode. In the past, we revamped all our 64-bit platforms. We introduced a 64-bit VM on Windows made garbage collection improvements. Uh, we came out with an alternative type of delay. There, there were some, some circumstances where there were issues with, with ones depending on how they were used. So there's a, a couple of different solutions. And also in store introduced atomic loading. On the encryption side of things, an interesting story here, we, because of the capability of the encryption we ran into some export issues with the government. So we decided our solution to that would be, well, we'll remove the internal encryption, we'll, we'll hook up to external libraries, and that will solve the problem. And after that was basically developed, that, that issue, that, that, that export ban was lifted. So I said, well, now we have two solutions. Well, we'll give our customers both solutions, so you can use internal encryption written in small talk, or if it's a standard in your organization, like OpenSSL, you can hook up to that solution. Some other big changes in the past. COM was revamped. COM64 introduced. ActiveX was, it used to be an add-on to the product, was integrated into the product. And the product launcher, which Basically, if you use Windows, Windows or Mac, there's, a, there's an icon installed on, the, on your desktop. And now that, that opens up a launcher, which allows you to create projects, find and open up your images. So it, it's something useful where, where it didn't used to be. And, and of course, the code it comes with the product, so you could extend that to be something specifically useful for, for your organization. Some other big things. In the past, we, as time went on, we ended up with multiple HTTP servers in the product. So we, we stepped back and said, okay, let's look at consolidating these and we'll replace them with one better one that is, and, and, and here the, the, the goal was to make basically a high performance, highly scalable HTTP server. So that's what Sue is. The capital X at the end is because it uses our Xstreams streaming protocol. What else? Well, to run on top of Sue, we came out with AppX, which is a modern web framework. 
Uh, it uses basically JavaScript on the front end, so you can use whatever the latest, greatest JavaScript things that are about the, out there in the JavaScript land and integrate those in with your objects on, the, on your Smalltalk server. Uh, one of the questions that we often get this, well, are you saying, does this replace Seaside? No, it actually can be used along with Seaside. Uh, we have a lot of customers who use Seaside. And actually the, the original developer of Seaside, Avi Bryant, some years ago gave a, a keynote talk about if, if he was starting Seaside over again today, how would I architect it? And that was essentially the, uh, the motivation for, for Apex. It, it's that architecture. So it, it doesn't replace it. it. It can be used in addition. Uh, you can look at both products and say, OK, for what I want to do here, which one works better? Uh, Jerry's here. Jerry will be talking about the, the latest, greatest changes with, uh, with Apex. So those are, those are some of the big changes in the past. What about the present? Our, our two new products, which will be available imminently, Object Studio 8.8 .8 and VisualWorks 8.2. So what have you done for me lately? What's, what is there to look forward to in, in this release? Well, some of the, some of the changes we've made We've upgraded the build chains, in other, in other words, the, the compilers and platform that we use to develop the product. So we've updated our, in this, in this uh, past release, we've upgraded our Windows, our OS X, and, and Linux had a, a major upgrade last cycle. Here's something, by the way, this is a hidden gem. Uh, before it was called VisualWorks 1.15. Now it has a more sensible name. The uh, VisWorks XL for extended loader. Now the basic loader that comes with the product is if, if you have multiple releases of uh, VisualWorks installed on your, on your machine, it'll find the right VM. And when you, when you double click on any image, it'll find the right VM and the right settings and, and open that up. If you're a developer, uh, we, we have a developer program, and we have basically weekly developer builds, basically alpha and beta builds that you can, your customer, you can receive. A lot of our customers do, and check those out. It's all our, you can see all, all the new things being developed in the product. And that, that has additional bytes beyond the two bytes. It uses four bytes, a four byte header. And this loader will use the right, the right image and home directory for all those development builds as well. So if you're part of our developer program, you probably want to check this out. It's, it's uh, very useful. We have some preview VMs with this release. A 64-bit version of, of OS X, 32-bit with Retina display support, and a Linux PPC 64-bit platform. These are all, all preview VMs. Every release, we try to make some updates and for our database support. So with this release, we have uh, enhancements to our scrollable cursors, enhancements for Postgres, SQLite, and Oracle. And I suggest if you use one of these particular database, databases, please check out our release notes for all the all the specifics on the improvements for that particular database. <coughs> Likewise, Glorp. I always like to joke to Glorp is Glorp is an when, when the engineers name the product. Uh, Glorp is an acronym that stands for Generalized Lightweight Object Relational Persistence. And so we've enhanced that. We have a new guide on the on the Glorp Atlas. We have in preview. You might think of it as recursive queries. They're also called common table expressions. So if a lot of the data that you deal with is, is hierarchical, you can get a lot of that data back in one query rather than in multiple queries. So it can be a big performance improvement for your application if it falls into that category. 
Internationalization is now built into the base image. You no longer have to load that separately. Some other big changes I mentioned earlier with the, the 2.0 changes. If you're a developer, this is, this is probably one of the biggest, biggest changes for, for both products for this release, and that is the autocomplete 2.0. I mentioned earlier people wanted autocomplete built into the product, and when we did a basic version of that, this new release, it's, it, it's taken way, way beyond the basic abilities of, the, of what we first introduced. And it, it's just very smart, gives you list, it does a whole lot for you. I highly recommend you check it out. Super useful. Very productive. Very, very enjoyable to use. Some other changes. One of the other 2.0 changes is look and feel to, also called UI skinning, where basically the, the components are still in small talk, but it uses on Windows and Mac the host operating system to render the widget. So you have, you have, you have much better host fidelity. And that was a long-standing request from customers is to, to improve that fidelity. And that's something that UI Skinning does. We came out with that. We, we got some feedback. Some customers like, like some things about the old framework, which you could basically have a look, uh, like a Windows look, for example, on any platform. So with the new improved framework, we developed an emulated Windows platform. So say if you run on on a Linux server and you use it over Citrix and you are, the people using the application are, are most comfortable with a Windows look, you can do that. And that was a, that was a specific customer <coughs> request. For developers, you can go in, I'll, I'll show this later in, in the hidden gems, you can change to a red background default or a green background default. And where this is really useful is say you're a developer and you have multiple images up. And what you can do is, say you have three images up, one you can have, you can say for example, have emulated Windows or, or native, if you're running on a Windows platform, one image you get out in red and one you get out in green. The usefulness of this is that whenever you grab a window, you know which image it belongs to, which is if, if you, you try to do this without problems, <coughs> much more difficult, it takes more time. With this release, we've also made some really nice browser enhancements. We have basically forward, backward arrows. So I mean, everybody uses web browsers, and the forward, backward, backwards in that is a, a, a means of navigation everyone's familiar with. You can now do that, move, move quickly backward and forward through the browser. Uh, in that manner. There's also browse method in class context. This is a, the, the name doesn't tell you too much. So one of the things in small talk often you'll say, okay, I'm looking at this method. Uh, who, who implements this method? And you can click and bring up a list. Okay. Okay, let me let me look at this one and let me let me open up the that method in the class. Well now I don't need this other window, so let me go back and close that and go back over here. So you've done some extra steps. And what this does, browse method in class context, instead of those several steps, you can basically open that method up in the class context in, in, in one step instead of multiple. So we're looking at some of these things to improve the productivity uh, in small time. In our, our net and protocol support, and this again is uh, based on specific feedback and, and talking with our customers. We had a number of customers using uh, a contributed Active Directory support called LDAP. And what we heard from several customers is that, well, we'd really love to improve that and support it. So with this release, that's, that's exactly what we did. We improved it. And we moved it to from contributed to supported. And we also came out with a secure version of that LDAP, secure LDAP. <coughs> a 
Another, and this is also based on customer request, we introduced OAuth 2 bearer tokens support. And OAuth 2 is an authorization standard used by things like Facebook, Twitter. So if you want to be able to communicate with those things, you're going to require this, which is why it was a request. <coughs> I mentioned earlier we've been improving Apex, and you'll hear more about the, that this week from, from Jerry. Uh, a number of things, and I'll point you directly to Jerry's presentation. We'll, we'll, hit, we'll discuss these things in this list in detail. I mentioned earlier one of the one of the things, one of the goals of product management is to keep moving the product forward and keep it modern, keep it vital. So one of the changes that we have in this release is a preview of HTTP2. And that's basically a major revision of, of HTTP. Uh, all the major browsers support it now. I, I look, I got the statistic of 8.4% of the 10 million uh, websites already support it. It makes better use of things like server push. And of course, you can use our, our SUE HTTP server to create an HTTP2 server. So we're trying to keep ahead of the curve on, because we know things like this in, in, for example, a year from now, we might start hearing from customers that, hey, we need this and we need this yesterday. So we try to get ahead of the curve on things like this. In contributed, we've added Rosal 2, and I believe uh, Alexander will be, will be uh, showing that and presenting that this week. Another thing that we try to do with every release is get the, the latest stable release of Seaside and, and package it and make sure that it works with the product and is easy to load and use by our customers using our products. So we have, uh, we've integrated uh, Seaside 3.2.0 with our product and you can find that in the repository with the next maintenance release it will be included on on the media itself. So basically these changes I've, I've discussed here are foundation changes that work with both of our products. We have a few, a few changes that are, are specific to Object Studio or to VisualWorks. I mentioned we've got a, a great new interface framework with our next generation user interface in Object Studio. And it really lets you take advantage of everything that Windows has to offer. Uh, Andreas is going to be talking about this week. They'll, they'll show it to you, talk to you about it, and ask him all the detailed questions. He, he, he loves this, is very passionate about it. And he's also built, using that technology, a new launcher. And it, focuses on, on convenience items, productivity, improving productivity, and he's also going to be presenting and discussing that, so I, I recommend those. I recommend you check those out. Oh, also there's a new workspace, also written in this next generation user interface. And finally, Syncom Smalltalk is Windows 10 certified. Uh, most of our, uh, the, the largest platform we have with Syncom Smalltalk is, is Windows. Single biggest platform. On the VisualWorks side, in preview is something called, I mentioned UI skinning look and feel too. We have something called classic skins and it uses the, the policies that the old ones used, for example, the same fonts and such, and this can ease the transition if you have a lot of interfaces in upgrading from 7.10.1 to 8.2. This may be of interest to you. So what about the future? Where, where are we going? Got a lot of changes. 
plan for the future. A lot of these are incremental uh, improvements. We're, we're making big improvements, but we know it, we can't basically say, okay, we're taking this old framework, throwing it out, replacing it with this new thing, and oh yeah, by the way, throw out all your old, old stuff and start over, because this is just wonderful. And that, that would essentially be a non-starter for our customers who have a, a lot have a large investment and want to, they want the improvements, they want to move forward, but they can't throw everything out and start over. So we are very aware of that. Uh, at at Syncom, our the product management mantra is if you make a customer change their code, make it worth it. Make it worth it. Uh, years ago, I was a, a, a customer, and when we said, okay, we wanted to upgrade to a new release, if you went to management and said, well, we want to we wanna move to the new release, and management says, well, well, what improvements will we get? And you tell them, none, they'll just be on the latest release, and say, well, forget it. You need improvements. You need to justify moving to a new release. So we very much are aware of that and, and try to focus on that for our customers. I'll be discussing these things one by one. Incremental improvements make it make it possible to port to. You, you can't say start over. Other things we'll continue doing, we'll continue revamping some major frameworks, coming out with version 2.0 things. We'll also continue to modernize and some examples of the past. Uh, uh, moving to TLS from SSL, we've got, as you see with this release, HTTP2, and continuing to improve productivity wherever we can in the product. Very, very important is that we continue to respond to customer needs. Uh, a lot of things that we develop come up they're, they're not things that we would see five years ahead of time. So a, a lot of things that customers require come about because of changing standards. And, and then we start to hear about what, what our customers need and use and, and focus on those. And, and we introduce those into the product. But they're, most of those are, are not seen five years ahead of time. They're just not. So it's really important to get feedback on, on you know, give us your feedback on how you use the product because again our success is is if you're able to be successful with the product. Another focus is I mentioned some things, some improvements for productivity. We'll continue with that. An another thing is API. We try to make sure like when you saw the new source code editor and the editor themes, there's an API to those. And it's important because, like I mentioned, a unique advantage of Smalltalk is having the whole development environment in Smalltalk and customers take advantage of that. They customize it to better support their process for doing work. And that's a big advantage. That's a big advantage of using Smalltalk. So we're aware of that. In the future, probably not next, probably not next year, probably a year after that, we'll move both products to a version nine together, and, and we'll, we'll try to do some some interesting things to to make a big bang with, with version nine. If you've ever if you've ever read an IBM document, you might appreciate the. The humor there. Uh, last year in this presentation, this was the slide I presented. There was a Stack Overflow developer survey done each year. And it's a nice survey on current languages. And I was, I was astonished that the small talk was nowhere to be found in it. 
So last year I said, let's, let's change this. This was an action item. Well, it was a, a good news, bad news. We found out about the survey, and when we were able to get out the word to the community, I know a number of you, and thank you. This was great. We got a response right away in it, and I think we hit the magic number, and they closed the survey very quickly after we got the, the word out. But we did get a bunch of, of folks, probably a lot of people in, in this room, got their surveys in. So the good news is that the developer survey, the Stack Overflow developer survey for 2016, includes small talk. So I think this is a big opportunity for us. So in 2015, no small talk. 2016, some small talk. 2017, let's get in early, let's get in a lot of small talk. So people who have never heard of small talk know nothing about it. They're going to see this thing go from nothing to, wow, what's all this interest? And, and we hope that will pique their interest and cause them to check, check out small talk. New young developers who have never heard of this thing. So I think this is a big opportunity for us. And, and I ask everyone here, when we, when we see this, please participate in the survey. Let's get the word out about small talk. I have a few minutes left. I'm going to just show a little preview of the Hidden Gems presentation that I have this afternoon. So I have a couple of, of short screencasts here. Okay, this first one is on sizing. Just a couple of tips for using the product. They may be obvious, maybe not. I know with some of these you're going to say, everybody knows that. But the one person that doesn't, they got a golden nugget. So here you open the browser, resize it to exactly what you want, close it. Now when you reopen it, it's the size you want. Again, you might be saying, well, everybody knows that, or, oh, wow. Okay, spawning things in the product. How can I better narrow down the universe of what I'm looking at? When you open up a browser, you have everything. What if I want to, what if I want a smaller universe at which to look at? What you do here is go to spawn. Let's choose non-syncom code. Now you're looking at a smaller universe. How can we make it even smaller still? You're looking at less, less stuff. You've windowed down the universe you're looking at. Spawn and choose the repository, your own personal repository, or the repository your team works with. And now you're looking at basically, essentially, just your team's application code. So you've really narrowed that down. So things are easier to find. And seeing everything is just a click away, so that's no problem. And this, this I find really useful, because if you can just winnow that down to just your stuff, the things that you want to work with. Can you do that uh, by namespace also? Uh, not currently. Not current. That would be a nice one. <laughs> Good suggestion. Thank you. <coughs> One more tip. Fewer windows. One of the age-old problems also with small talk is you tend to start opening up lots and lots of windows. Sometimes you get so overwhelmed you just close everything down and start over again. So how can you open up less? less? Well, one thing you can do is there's RB tab browsers, and that's useful, but you actually have tabs in the browser but the tabs are, are, are basically hidden. So you can open up multiple browsers into one window. New browser. And you can view 
view those and you can select Alt and the number so you can go Alt, 1, 2, 3 and flip through those browsers. So you can actually have a quite a number there in one window and get to them very quickly and easily. Alt, 1, 2, 3. So in this case I have 3. Alt, 1, 2, 3. Or you can simply go up to the menu and choose it. And again, either you're saying everybody knows that or, wow, it's useful, I can use that. Any questions? That is the end of my presentation. Yes, Neil? Um, I was just saying, uh, one of the things that I've always wanted to do with the, uh, the views that you've just shown there was actually be, be able to convert a number of open windows into a single window where all those windows are views. If you had several open windows that were all 410, you could just do that. <coughs> and often when you're closing windows or moving them up position, that would actually help. I think a single grab drop uh, I'm working on that. So, so what, Neil, what Neil said was that he thought it would be a great idea if we could take, take windows and basically consolidate them into one. And he's got some ideas on that that he's looking into. Any more questions? Just for your first gen you show, when I'm working that way, you just feel, yeah, that it should be, and you don't recognize that it's there. But going backward to the old version, to an older version, it doesn't, oh, it didn't have it. So a lot of the things you just get used to the first time, you see it immediately, and then only going backwards you realize that. Good point. Gary's mentioning that you get used to these things and you just kind of expect them to work like that. And that's certainly something I've, I've, I've noticed over time as we move from, say, this works 5 to 7. Once you've got used to improvements in the 7, if you move back to 5, it's like, oh, wow, I'm missing this, this, and this. Oh, this is so old. And, and I think you're going to find the same thing when you get used to things like 8.2 and, and all the improvements in it. If you have to go back to 7.x, you're going to say, oh, I really miss all these, all these new capabilities. I think you'll find them the same thing. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, I saw that uh, several things you mentioned uh, has to do with productivity. My question is, uh, are your customers uh, really worried about the productivity and how this benefits improve their productivity here? So part of the question is, is our, our customer is concerned about productivity? We showed several things about productivity. And, and the answer is yes. I mean, that's actually one of the big advantages of small talk is the productivity. Uh, the Capers Jones survey where it, he, Surveys all, all the languages every every five or seven years, and the last one to come out still says small talk is basically the most productive general purpose language, still, and that's that's a big advantage. Uh, other advantages in, in productivity and in customizability I mentioned, like with the APIs, and, and yes, absolutely, I get I get feedback from customers saying, you know, this is productive, but. Like the one example where I showed, where you, where you take out a couple of steps to get to the same result. If you're doing that 100 times a day, really appreciate it, and it's a big improvement. If you can continue to, to make inroads on that uh, to an already very productive environment, it, it, just, it just puts us that much more ahead of other, other uh, competitive environments and more reason for people to check out Smalltalk and all of its advantages. I mean, Smalltalk was what developed by a bunch of geniuses over largely a 10-year period with massive investment. They didn't have to worry about any products. And that, that's such a rare situation. Who else has put that investment into building a new language? That's why Smalltalk is one of the reasons Smalltalk is so unappreciated. All that investment into making something really good.